Okay. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jeff Bowles. I'm the Risk, Safety, and Industry Relations Manager for Pigeon Mountain Industries and the host of today's PMI Technical Webinar Series. Before we begin, I want to address some housekeeping items. All attendees will be muted during the entire webinar. Uh, we will have time at the end of the presentation to answer any questions you may have. For questions related to the presentation, presentation topic, you may type in and send any questions at any time during the webinar, or you may use the chat function to communicate with the host. That's me. Uh, the webinar will last about one hour. If you are having trouble with your sound, you may switch uh, from your computer to your phone or the reverse as needed. Okay, let's get started. Today we have a unique presentation from Martin Barnett. Martin is PMI's uh, Vertical Rescue Solutions Training Manager. He is originally from Wales and enjoys rock climbing and ice climbing in his spare time. He also leads uh, high altitude mountaineering trips all over the world. Uh, Martin is one of approximately 500 people to have climbed the seven highest mountain summits from each continent. Today is here to share his unique perspective and experiences. Okay, let's get started. I give you Martin Barnett. Well, thank you very much, Jeff, and uh, thank you very much to everybody else that uh, is signed in today. I really appreciate you uh, listening in. So we'll get started. Um, here we are, and the question I get asked most often is, why do you do these things? And the question must be answered by, well, I, I really enjoy it, uh, even though I uh, go through many trials and tribulations, cold times, hot times, suffering times. I really do enjoy it, so therefore I keep going back for, for more and more, and I'm sure um, several of you can uh, relate to that um, with all the kinds of sports and activities that you do. Maybe different for others, uh, as old George Mallory said, because it's there. And I like this quote on this right-hand side here. Some of the world's greatest feats were accomplished by people not smart enough to know they were impossible. So I think uh, I probably fall into that category as well. I'll be honest with you, um, I could probably talk to you about an hour on each one of these mountains, but because I've just got a, an hour here, uh, you have to excuse me if I breeze through some of the, uh, the topics of mountains. Uh, feel free to ask me questions, or I can give you my email address at any time, and you're more than welcome to, to contact me here at PMI or any other time if you need to know uh, any more about what I've done or if you're looking to do some of these mountains yourself or any other mountains for that matter. You're probably expecting to hear some crazy stories and to be honest I don't really have too many crazy stories. Uh, I've experienced a few wild times out there but uh, to me crazy stories really equate to epics and, and thankfully being a mountain leader uh, mountain epics are not really what I'm looking for. It's more to be a safe and um, and uh, a challenging climate and also to enjoy our experience. Moving on to that, as you can see with the pictures I've got shown here, I don't just climb the seven summits. <clears throat> and to be honest, I'm not necessarily a big fan of just a tick list to climb the seven summits. I'm more of a fan of climbing in general. Uh, as you can see here, I, I like to rock climb and ice climb, do a little bit of uh, mixed climbing and even a touch of aid climbing. And uh, obviously from my background, I've done a, a lot of mountaineering as well. So really the seven summits have, have just kind of come together with me and uh, fortunately um, being a mountain leader I've been able to do those as a guide. Uh, as far as preparing myself goes, uh, over the years, and it's been 15 years or so now that I've been climbing, I've really been able to prepare myself through a lot of experience training in places like uh, the European Alps and Rocky Mountain National Park has really given me a lot of experience. And the last thing I ever wanted to do was to get in over my head and get myself in the precarious situations there where I can't get myself out. There's definitely been some tough times and to be honest you can ask yourself well what could happen and really the answer is Anything could happen, lots. Uh, you really don't know what could happen out there because there's so many different kind of situations you get yourself in. 
and therefore you have to be kind of prepared for the uh, the unknown but at least to understand that you can deal with anything you've got to ask yourself what do you need and what might I need uh, for example I was on a, an 8,000 meter peak Choi Oyu and um, we had a small avalanche in, in a separate team that hit a few Sherpas and uh, a doctor was starting to work on um, one of the Sherpas and he was asking for forceps and all sorts of things like that and, and honestly we had to tell him we just don't have that kind of equipment with us we have to adapt with the equipment we've got and therefore go with and use the um, <clears throat> the equipment that we have on us at that time and it, it's just a matter of, of dealing with um, the situations you get yourself into. So, the seven summits, how many are there? Well, of course, you would think there were seven, um, but just like everything else, that is not necessarily the case. It really depends on how you look at it. So, even thinking of our highest mountain there, uh, Mount Everest, everybody knows it as the highest mountain, 29,000 feet, but is it really? If you can compare that to Mauna Kea over in Hawaii, it's actually about 13,000 feet, but as you can see, it's about 33,000 feet from its base. Unfortunately, most of that base is under the ocean bed, so therefore it makes it extremely hard to climb. And um, therefore, you'd only actually be climbing, you know, 10,000 feet of it or so. But you could look at that as being the highest mountain. You could also look at Chimborazo over in Ecuador. Its actual height is 20,000 feet, but because of the curvature of the Earth and the, the way the Earth is actually egg-shaped, at the equator, it's actually bulged out. So Chimborazo at 20,000 feet is the furthest point away from the center of the Earth. So you could look at that as being the highest mountain. But for the most part, we all agree Mount, Mount Everest is the highest point. Then you could look at Europe. Um, it has pretty much been decided that it is Mount Albrecht at um, 5,600 meters, but because that is on the Eurasia um, Peninsula, so to speak, it's over um, between Europe and Asia, and, and it's very unclear exactly what is classed as Asia and what's Europe. Um, there's a little bit of discussion um, being that Mont Blanc is 15,000 feet and that's in the Alps um, over in, in France. Um, but for the most part, we've decided uh, Elbrus is the highest point and everyone has agreed on that. Now, the one that's probably most controversial is uh, <clears throat> Mount Kosciuszko, which is in Australia, comparing that to Punkinjaya. Punkinjaya is just a different name in case you've not heard of that for uh, Karstens Pyramid. Karstens Pyramid is right at around 16,000 feet and Kosciuszko is 7,000 feet. Well, you've got to ask yourself, I know most um, places in America learn that Australia is a continent, so therefore being an island and a continent, uh, Kosciuszko would be the highest point in, in um, Australia. But many of us learn and, and think about that whole region, Australasia or Oceania, if you like, as being a continent. So therefore that includes New Zealand, Indonesia, um, several thousand small islands all in that small range uh, and if that is the highest area of those small of those mountains um, the highest mountain in uh, in that area would be uh, Karstens Pyramid that's at uh, 16,000 feet so depending on how you look at it really depends on how uh, how you decide to climb the seven summits Fortunate enough, I, I ended up doing them both, so uh, there was no question for me, um, which was the, uh, and, and honestly, it really, it really didn't matter to me. So then, then that's to consider there. As you can see here, you can see that the mountains are obviously in the different continents, and um, we are now going to run through uh, uh, just the, the general area of where the mountains are throughout the presentation. 
you can just going back there for a second um, talking about uh, the seven summits who was the first person to climb the seven summits um, it's quite well known that Dick Bass in 1985 is actually the first person and a, an American to climb the seven summits but that was with him climbing Kosciuszko whereas just one year later in 1986 the Canadian Pat Morrow was the first person to climb the seven summits with the uh, Karstens pyramid so as we said, I'm going to talk about my adventures now. Uh, I started off with Kilimanjaro. These are in no particular height order, just in the order that I decided to climb them. Remember at this time, I had no intention to climb the Seven Summits. It was more of an experience, more of um, to go to these continents, go to these countries and experience a mountain at the same time. So for Kilimanjaro, you fly into um, Kenya. Uh, into Nairobi and then you drive down south into Kilimanjaro. Kilimanjaro is quite interesting because it is the highest freestanding mountain in the world. That basically means it's not in a mountain range at all. Um, so it really sticks out the ground quite proud. Looking at Kilimanjaro here, as you can see, it is a pretty impressive view. Not only it's the mountain itself, but the vegetation around it and the animals. You don't always get to see giraffe and an elephant in these positions, but most people do tend to go and do a safari at the same time. And it's a mountain that most people can do if you're willing to just train and um, have a short period of time. Uh, it's definitely something I'd highly recommend. Now, Kilimanjaro in general has several routes. As you can see on the right-hand side, this Marango route is the most popular route, also known as the Coca-Cola route. And um, it's a great route, but it is very busy. And of course, that creates a little more issues as far as that might not be the reason that you go in, uh, but maybe a little bit more trash in just general. Uh, a lot of people. I actually took the Machame route on this left hand side, still quite busy, um, but um, it was very, um, a very good route indeed, and, and so many of these other routes are great too. The good thing about Kilimanjaro is it never gets boring. Um, not the, the others do, but you go through five different ecosystems when you're climbing Kilimanjaro. Starting lower down where the initial hut star, it starts at a rainforest, moving up through a cultivated zone onto a, a forest zone. Above that forest zone, around 9,000 feet, it moves into a moorland, so becoming a lot more desolate. And then right at around 13,000 feet, it turns into an alpine desert. As you can see, there is still a little bit of snow at the top, and uh, unfortunately, that is melting uh, significantly year by year. This is the Kilimanjaro summit, as you can see, and hopefully remember, it is a volcano, so therefore, uh, you can go and visit that. The actual volcano section shown here to the left is not actually near the summit, so some people are not able to see both, um, but it is a... Uh, uh, and very impressive and rather flat summit so uh, you can spend uh, time up there if the weather's good. Um, it's about a 13 foot elevation gain and one thing I would definitely recommend, the first thing I think of when I think of Kilimanjaro is the amount of time it takes you to climb it. When you look at uh, guide companies, they can often say we can do it in five days and I'd highly recommend against doing this because it is such an elevation gain and uh, a, a fairly high mountain at 19,000 feet. The last thing you want to be doing is pushing your altitude limits. The amount of people that you see with AMS, which is acute mountain sicknesses, and even worse, uh, pulmonary edema, uh, just because they've taken an extra couple of days um, less than they should. So I would highly recommend taking one week or at least nine days if you're able to uh, and you're more likely to summit, you're more likely to enjoy it and get an overall better experience. It's just um, by far better than trying to push it and, and rush through it. The next mountain I decided to do was Mount Elbrus. As you can see here on the right hand side, it is very much on the border of um, Russia and Georgia. When I did it back in the day, uh, there was some war conflict and I could actually hear uh, some missiles and bombs going overhead. It wasn't though I felt I was in a very dangerous situation, but it is very unusual. 
Uh, it is in an area of the Caucasus range, uh, actually a very, very impressive range, and um, one that you'd love to climb several of those mountains, but because it's very remote, it's a lot harder to get to them, and you just have to create a lot more time, a lot more visas and permits to get to those mountains. Um, whereas, obviously, Elbrus being the highest, it's very established now from guiding companies. As you can see, uh, it's very open and uh, it does have two summits. It has an east summit and a west summit. Um, below the snow level right here is not the most glamorous. It's not the best area to walk. So usually for the week beforehand, you'll acclimatize on a different mountain range or hikes all around that area. And you're able to uh, really get a good acclimatization rate without going on the mountain at all. And then, believe it or not, you can go up in chairlifts and that, they drop you off a couple of minutes before the, the barrel huts over here at 3,800 meters. You walk a few minutes and you take your gear across and therefore you set yourself up in these barrel huts. Uh, you may not have heard about them, but they're quite interesting. Um, sometimes there's a few mice running around and it's quite um, airy to hear them scurrying around in the middle of the night, but sometimes that's just part of it. The first day uh, would make sense to go up to Patched Off Rocks, higher up at around 4,700 meters, uh, just to get an extra bit of acclimatization. You get a feel for the mountain, you get an understanding of what the weather patterns are gonna start to do, and just generally uh, you, you're out in the crampons and, and seeing what's going around. Come back, maybe take a rest day, or you just get up early, two or three o'clock that night, and go for the summit. Again, you go back up to Past Off Rocks, move across here towards the West Summit. Now, unfortunately, the East Summit is only a few meters lower, but that doesn't see half as much traffic because of the, uh, the height. If it's not the highest point, many people uh, are not really interested in going up there. Going, moving across to that West Summit, this is along this pass here and along the, this uh, channel is where the wind really starts to pick up and it really can be quite chilly um, as you see in this picture on the right hand side. As you can see, I've been fortunate enough to be uh, on the summit twice there now, um, back in 2002 and just a couple of years ago. The expedition does take about two weeks two weeks, which is about right, with an elevation gain just over 10,000 feet. And as you can see, the Caucasus range in the background is, uh, is fantastic for, uh, for any um, aspiring climbers that want to do either unknown peaks or just don't want any crowds at all, because you really will not see many pe uh, people on these peaks at all. And if you do, um, they tend to be many Russians and uh, people from around that area. There's some very challenging and technical peaks moving on in that area. So moving on from there, uh, my next mountain was in Aconcagua. Uh, Aconcagua is in Argentina. It's just on the border there between um, Argentina and Chile. Uh, you fly into Mendoza, it's a great place to get yourself settled in, enjoy the, uh, the culture before you move across west towards the mountain range of the Andes. Aconcagua is the highest point outside of Asia, so therefore it's by far the highest point in the Western Hemisphere. It only has a success rate of around 60%, and we'll talk about why that is in a, in a short time. It is a pretty impressive mountain from afar, but if you're very familiar with the 14ers, I class it as, as a larger 14er. It's very, got lots of rubble, it's got lots of scree down below, and you can do this mountain without very much snow travel at all. As you can see, um, this glacier in front of us is called the Polish Glacier. Many people like to go with the intention of doing that, but unfortunately, they don't get a chance. Whether it's due to altitude problems or conditions, this, does, this glacier doesn't get climbed quite as much as, as people would like. And if you have the intention of doing that, I'd highly recommend it. I've never had the opportunity to do it myself, um, but many um, people do and, and turn around and it is possible at the bottom of the foot of this glacier, you're able to turn there and continue around and that will eventually take you to this area right here, which is uh, 
um, the, the highest camp where all the, uh, the routes kind of come into it. Um, and uh, it does get quite busy there. So just be aware um, with this glacier, um, the Polish glacier, when we were there, um, people need to do it quick because the idea is that you're going to do it fast um, over a, um, a short period of time and it is quite long. So you're going to make sure you're using correct protection, always making sure you either have an ice screw or, or a picket or two in between you and your partner, but you also need to do it fairly quickly. So uh, when we were there, unfortunately, one of the, uh, um, somebody's partners fell and uh, drug them down in, into a crevasse and we never saw them again. And you'll be surprised how many stories like that we hear on the Polish glacier. Moving over to the, the camp on the right hand side, uh, Condorus. And this is uh, a camp that gets busy because it amalgamates with all the routes or several of the routes on that side. It starts to get very cold and windy. Uh, Aconcagua is known for its white wind, so don't be surprised at all if you've been wearing regular style pants up until this point, and then you wake up the next day and it's a howling wind because it, it really is very cold and it turns a lot of people down. Also, people get to that point and they just realize it's a little bit too much for them, unfortunately. As you can see here, this is one of the mountains uh, of the Seven Summits where you have to carry all your gear yourself. Although, you know, there are porter opportunities, this tends to be uh, the mountain where everyone wants to carry their own things. And with these heavy loads, it makes it extremely difficult um, to uh, not only carry everything up, but to carry it down as well. Unfortunately, over the years, Aconcagua got a reputation for being quite dirty, a lot of human waste. Um, so they've changed it over the last few years where you carry your human waste down, which I think is an excellent idea. I'm all for it. Um, but again, that is a lot heavier. And of course, you're carrying all your own trash around with you as well because you go up in several stages just because of the height you can go up to a camp come down and then go up the next day go to your camp and stay there so you end up going up the mountain about two or three times and you're always taking that little bit extra gear extra equipment of course when you get to your high camp and you need it back um, to bring it all back down together that makes it extremely difficult to carry down and people just get generally worn out and tired by that point. Um, people often ask me what's the hardest mountain you've climbed um, and this has to be up there really. I've actually um, had the opportunity to be on it and guide it about four times and I've only actually summited once so I guess technically this is the hardest mountain um, although it's by far not the the coldest or the most technically challenging mountain that I've done. Um, it's just the conditions we had. We either had some illnesses or we had uh, bad weather. Believe it or not, we had an um, avalanche concern, which is very unknown. But that just goes to show that you never quite know what you're going to come up against. The average expedition length is around three weeks and, and uh, you definitely uh, give yourself a good length of time to summit in that time. Uh, the summit, again, is, is very flat, and you can see I take my Welsh flag up with me wherever I go. Moving on from that, uh, we'll now talk about uh, Denali. Many of you may know it as Mount McKinley, and of course it is the highest mountain in North America, being up there in uh, Alaska. You fly in, most people go from Anchorage, um, moving on to Talkeetna, and that is your base there before you fly out of Talkeetna to the bottom of the mountain. It does have an extreme amount of elevation gain. And so 5,900 meters um, above its base is what you've got to climb, which is a lot more than Everest and any other of the seven summits. Also being so high in latitude, so higher up in the, the earth, it also feels a lot more than 20,000 feet. It feels more like 22,000 feet or so, or so because of the latitude. And that just affects you as far as the altitude's concerned. And even just 2,000 feet feels a lot harder to climb at that altitude. 
as you can see the picture here, not many people get to see this kind of picture because it's often covered in snow, um, and, and sorry, in cloud. Um, but as you can see, it does raise out of the ground quite impressive there above the glacier. This is a picture here back in the day with a, a motley crew, and, and this was a mountain many years ago where we've uh, um, really learning about cold weather mountaineering. Um, I, th I wanted to put this picture in so you get a good understanding and a good idea of um, the root of, um, of Denali. Starting here back on the Calhitna Glacier, um, you actually go down Heartbreak Hill. It's it's called Heartbreak Hill because when you have to come back, you actually have to come up the hill. And it's, uh, it's very tough after being on the mountain for so long. Moving around, you can see you've got the triangle and the, and the square here showing up altitudes. There are several camps along this area. Uh, many people will go up and, and, and complete the style of mountaineering of the climb high, sleep low. So they will come, um, build a camp, come back down, take another cache back up and sleep up there. We didn't actually do that. We went slow and steady. So we had an extra camp along the way and we just took all of our equipment with us because you do carry um, sleds, um, but we didn't go as far. So therefore, if you're not going as far, we didn't go as high. So we were just very careful with our acclimatization at the time. And we'd also obviously be aware of everybody else depend on how they're uh, feeling. And you go across Windy Corner, no matter how um, calm it is, there's usually a breeze to say the least at Windy Corner, and you find yourself at 14,000 foot camp. This is very busy area. It's where a lot of the rangers will, uh, will stay for the whole season. And it's really glad that they do because it is such a busy mountain. They're really helpful, even just as far as giving you an understanding what's ahead of yourself, but mainly for rescues and support. Not that we want to ever rely on them, but it's really helpful that they are there. You can also complete uh, other routes from here. You can go up towards the West Rib from there and continue up the top half of the West Rib, or you can come back down and go along the fork to the bottom of the West Rib and you can complete the West Rib um, as a whole. That's a very impressive route. And also you can continue on and do the Cassine Ridge. That's an even more impressive route. Uh, it's a lot more commitment it's a lot more challenging. Um, and, um, you know, if that's something that you have an interest, I say go for it. Um, but you can't be expecting to summit on some of these ridges because uh, the conditions can be a lot worse. And so for can the weather and you've got to move really quickly. So uh, depending on if you get a good spell um, depends on if you've even got a chance or not. We did the West Buttress route. That goes from uh, 14,000 foot up to just above 16,000 feet. And you use your hand ascenders on um, some fixed lines there. You'll often do that just as an acclimatization day and then come back down. And then the next day or, or after that, you can move on up until the 17,000 foot camp. Some people use that, but if you're really fit or feeling really strong, you can continue all the way up to the summit. Of course, knowing that you've got to come down that way, it's a really big day, and therefore you probably don't have sleeping bags. Um, so you've got to be really quite committed. We decided to, that we were going to have this 17,000 foot camp, and that was uh, adequate for us. Fortunately enough, to get to the top, you move across the football field and up onto the summit. Again, as you can imagine, Denali, the way it is and its reputation, it is extremely cold, about minus 40 or so here with the wind. So uh, I was pretty wrapped up and uh, pretty excited to get to the, to the top of this one. You know, people talk about regular routes versus more challenging routes. I really think it's up to you. Uh, I'd never been on Denali before. I was excited just to do the regular route, and, and I was okay with that. Um, so I think it should be a very individual compared to, uh, oh, it should be something a little bit more uh, technical. Uh, it's really uh, what you should uh, um, be feeling is, is your level. 
moving on from there, um, the one that you probably want to hear about the most is Mount Everest. As you know, it is the highest mountain in the world at 29,000 feet, and the first summiters there were um, Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzin Norgay. It raises on average about four millimeters a year, but then so does the, the sea level, so who knows what exactly it is rated and, and raising. Uh, depending on who you talk to, you, you talk to the Nepalese and they call it uh, Sagamatha, or the Tibetans uh, Chungamunglu, Chungamunga, sorry, uh, goddess mother of the earth. But honestly, they speak English so well, they're very connected to uh, Westerners, and they tend to call it Everest most of the time themselves. People often ask me about training, and um, this picture up on the right hand side is, is no joke. Um, although I never actually wore my suit here, you can see I'm on a, it's more of a hill than a mountain, although it's called Table Mountain. It's just outside of Golden, Colorado, with Denver in the background. I put this on just for a picture, but you'd be surprised how much of my training I actually did on this hill. Um, most of that winter was uh, it's a heavy snow year, and I was finding it was even more dangerous, or um, I was wasting a lot of my time um, just driving, getting into the mountains. So I decided to do a lot of hiking on North Table Mountain. Now, it didn't look quite like this. It had lots of snow on it um, up until my thighs and, and um, my waist in sometimes. And that was more of a training for my mind. So a lot of these mountains I find you can do them. They're not overly technically challenging, but your mind has to be strong. You need to continue. And if you ask yourself, one, am I fit enough to do this? Am I healthy enough to do this? Is the weather good? And obviously, if all the conditions around me are, are allowing me to do it, can I continue? Many times people will get to certain points and just you just have enough and you say, I'm pleased I've got to this point. Uh, others are proud of me if that's something that's you know of, of consideration and you go down. But if you actually want to summit these peaks, you have to push through and continue. And that's where this mountain really did help me, believe it or not, because I could see my, my house from the top of this mountain. I had my snowshoes in my backpack, yet I was trembling around in the snow uh, um, very frustrated that I was moving around in, in heavy snow and it was very flat because there was, there was no avalanche issues and um, I would walk around up there for hours just saying that I had to continue, I had to push on and that was one form of training uh, and that's very important in, in these bigger kind of slog mountains where it's you have to just keep on pushing through. Of course I did do other technical climbs and other um, training uh, you can see here on the left hand side, this is the Diamond of Long's Peak over in Rocky Mountain National Park. And uh, it's extremely windy up there in the winter. Actually, people say it's great training for, for places like Patagonia and all over the world. So I got to able to do several mountains in Rocky Mountain National Park here. This was just one where we went up Lamb Swider across Broadway and up through the Notch Couloir, um, also did the Kuna's routes and just lots of general mountaineering routes um, around this area. Also just seeing how my systems work. So getting a lot of experience. Here we stayed, this is a, a rock uh, just below uh, um, this um, lake right here and um, just get a feel for how did my cooking system work? How long does it take to, to boil water or, or to melt ice, for example? Do I actually like the food that I'm eating? Oh, are these bars actually just freezing and can I eat them at all? So just to get lots of experience before you go out into these mountains. So moving on towards Kathmandu itself, uh, as I mentioned, I like to go to a lot of these mountains to experience the culture, and uh, it's not just about the mountain, but uh, this is just a feel for what Kathmandu is like.
So as you can see, that's just a feel for, for the place, you know. I really love the cultures, you know. Um, a lot of the boys there hold hands. It's just a different way of looking at life. Um, they're very friendly. They're, they're just very nice to each other. You see the cows walking around. They're actually classed as, you know, people's ancestors, believe it or not. So you can't touch any of the cows or hurt them. Um, but they're just part of their everyday life and living. And um, it's something that I definitely really appreciate appreciated obviously it's not always the, the most healthy way you know but there's definitely a lot of bugs and and um, the hygiene isn't the best for some of the food um, but they do do the best um, even though it's sometimes difficult for us so-called weak westerners to go over there sometimes we can get a few uh, um, stomach issues so um, we actually went on the Tibetan side, so technically that's China. So we went from Kathmandu, uh, several days drove across the Rainbow Bridge into Tibet. From there we actually drove up to base camp. You can talk about is it cheating or not walking, but honestly we're there to climb the mountain and the amount of um, bugs and, uh, and and problems that you can gain with uh, eating some of the food and just connecting with some of the low local towns. It's just not worth it half the time. So we move through those towns fairly quickly. It still takes about four days to get to base camp and then you kind of start to acclimatize at base camp. And um, there's been many times where I've had my head under a towel with steaming hot water just trying to to clear my nostrils because it becomes so dry so quickly and you're coughing continuously and that becomes a big problem because you're up at night, you can't sleep, uh, that on top of the altitude. Um, I remember um, I was delayed even at base camp several times before I was able to move up the mountain because I just couldn't breathe very well. It wasn't more of a consideration of can I breathe at all? It's just, do I want to push it going up in altitude, knowing that that could cause more problems? But this is what uh, base camp looks like at around um, 17,000 feet. my tent and everybody else is in the group moving around to the Sherpa's tent and there's other groups in the background and then as we look up far far away nearly to a hidden cloud is Mount Everest herself So that's the view of the, the mountain that we've got um, day after day and week after week, really. And sometimes it's very difficult to, to have a mountain right behind you because you can see it and you just get so fixated on the mountain. So I actually decided to have my door facing the opposite way. So I wasn't so obsessed on it every day. Um, because as you can imagine, that's pretty much the topic of every conversation, especially going into it. Moving from there, now you can see the, the kind of um, topography and you can see the ridge that uh, will lead you up to the summit. Just looking on this uh, diagram on the right hand side, north is actually um, down towards the bottom of the screen. Uh, coming from the north side, um, you move up through a long spell of walking up until base camp, advanced base camp, which is right around there. Sometimes you'll hear uh, three camps, six camps, well it's really just the same, it just depends where you classify your camps from. So if you looked at it as in six camps, therefore it would be uh, your base camp would be one, your interim base camp would be uh, right in the middle there, Adv advanced base camp would be right um, where the marker is right now, and uh, Four, five, and six would be, one would be more towards the, the col there, and then moving up towards the ridge. If you look at it as in three camps, then you would just start from advanced base camp. If you're interested in ever going to Everest from, this is the Tibet side, of course, this is very different from the Nepalese side where you walk in, which is a, a magical experience on its own. I would highly recommend going on the Nepalese side because you do get to go through those towns, Namchi Bazaar and all sorts of um, Tembashe, 
and and uh, you can get to experience uh, the local people a little bit more. The monasteries are incredible to visit, and um, you are able to still go to uh, places like Amadablam, which is a fantastic mountain, and also up towards uh, Everest Base Camp itself. If you decide to go this way, which is significantly cheaper, you're still able to go to Advanced Base Camp, um, and for a lot cheaper price, you can go up towards the North Pole, and you can actually actually hike up Changse. Changse is a fantastic mountain itself and you're able to get a fantastic view of Everest and just the general expedition feel, just the, the nature of everyday um, expedition life uh, and come down for just a, a tenth of the cost really. But of course my plan was to, was to continue up um, towards uh, the summit. This is um, a little bit of what advanced space sites like. Uh, again, there, there's very little life, although you might see the occasional mouse. Um, but this is pretty much the highest point that humans can live consistently. Um, you can't really go beyond this 21,000 feet and be able to sustain uh, living month after month. Cook shelter and the dining shelter. Moving across to the other camps. For surprise. And then there's a call. Moving up to camp one. From one to camp one. Moving across the ridge. Up to camp two. Camp three. And then the summit pyramid and the summit in the background. As you got to see there, there were uh, some really nice tents, and uh, I'll be honest with you, they weren't ours. They were they were dining shelters for a uh, um, a, a guy or expedition leader called Russell Bryce. Um, over the years, he spent a lot of time doing expeditions, um, a lot of areas, um, both north and south side of Everest, and uh, he does run excellent expeditions. And fortunately, they cost around $60,000, and that was really not what we were going for. First of all, because we couldn't afford it, and second of all, we went as a group of 16, which was quite interesting because I didn't know anybody at the time. Um, it brought the costs down, um, but we could share the Sherpas, uh, we could share our tents, so we only had so many tents above this advanced base camp. Um, that was great, it worked out really well, we just had to be really careful because we were going up and down at different times, we had to be careful that a group wasn't coming down down expecting to use the tents as we went up and we were all expecting to use the same tents up the same night. Therefore, that would have caused a huge problem. So apart from that, um, it worked out really well and um, it, it did bring the cost down for us. Um, we did have a nice tan tents and a dining shelter, uh, but we didn't have much more. Um, other groups may have, um, you know, nice chairs, a very nice way of living, um, but you do have to pay for it, that's for sure. You know, some people might go up there just with their own tent, two, three tents for the whole expedition and want to do it without Sherpa support. And I'm a big fan of that too. So once again, it really is, you can do these mountains um, however you want to do them and, uh, and uh, doing in your style. Moving up along, moving through this mountain, as you can imagine, uh, we get to some more extreme areas. Now, for those of you that know um, the story of Mallory, Mallory and Irvine, this was the general area uh, outside of this camp was where they found Mallory. Unfortunately, the, the Mallory was not the one with the camera. Um, there's a good chance if they ever do find Irvine, he's the one with the camera. But this is the general area that they were looking. Now, this is Camp 3. This is pretty much the highest campground in the world and the only one above 8,000 meters. Actual purpose camping ground, if that's what you want to call it. And, uh, and this is what it's like to uh, be up there. And it's extremely tough to breathe without oxygen. What did they get? Put the uh, 
from it is just that they're so we're not too far away. <sighs> As you can hear, it's definitely a lot harder to breathe up there. Uh, and although the summit is wind reach, it's still a long time. I call it a campsite, but really we get there around two or three in the afternoon and we do try and um, sleep for a couple of hours, try and eat, and it leads us to high extra altitude living. From there we'll get up at around 10.30 and then move up from there up towards the ridge. As you can see uh, I did use oxygen. Again that's personal preference. At that point I'd never even been above uh, 7,000 meters so I felt that this was the last point that I would want to ever try not using oxygen and to be honest I wanted to summit and I was perfectly comfortable with using oxygen and uh, and I don't know if I would have been able to do it without it and uh, everyone's got that preference right there. Um, I was able to sleep on it for an hour or so just on about one liter a minute just so I've got that extra little bit of energy. I try to feed myself as much as I can. Uh, I ate about half of this meal. Um, people do try and eat bars but at this altitude basically your stomach is eating itself. This is in the, the death zone that we know of and it makes it very difficult to really do anything. Going to the bathroom is very difficult. Honestly, my pee was very um, yellow and frothy and just hardly anything of it. It's just tough living. Um, there's no doubt about it. It's very difficult to, to survive. And the idea is that you're not up there for very long. Um, I tend to not lose a lot of weight very quickly because I am very slim, whereas other people will tend to lose a lot of weight very quickly. So different metabolisms work in different ways. Moving from there, as you can see, um, there's a couple of tough steps there for those of you that think Everest isn't uh, challenging as far as technical wise. Sure, you don't have to use any technical rock climbing ability, um, but if these steps weren't here, uh, it would be very difficult. Um, actually, the same year that we were there, Conrad Anker and Leo Holden went up there, moved these steps out of the way and tried to climb them in old style, old boots um, equipment to see if Mallory and Irvine could have done it. They did it. They said it was extremely difficult, um, but I'm sure they came away with the opinion that um, the guys back in, in uh, you know, 50, 70 years ago uh, were a little tougher than we kind of are now. We use equipment and are able to climb harder things, but just generally they are very, uh, they were very tough mentalities. And I'm sure, and I, I just like to think that they were able to do it. As you can see, um, this is known as uh, the second step. Uh, sometimes does um, cause a few clogs as far as people coming up together and causing cues, um, but everybody is able to get, to get through it. This is similar to the opposite side of a the mountain. Uh, they would come up from uh, Nepal, going up uh, the Western Coom, and then from there up to the Hillary Step. Of course, the Hillary Step has changed over the last year or so with it, uh, a little bit of it coming down. So I'll be interested to hear reports of uh, exactly how that has uh, changed that side of the mountain. But as you can see here, uh, not easy by any means. And then you've got to realize that you are above 8,000 meters. Moving on there, um, you can see this, um, the um, summit pyramid. Uh, when I got to this point, I'll be honest with you, I did share it, shed a bit of a tear. It, it was kind of came out of nowhere. It just, it just kind of hit me. Uh, and um, I actually said, you know, I've done it, you know, even though I hadn't got to the top at this point, I know I could do it. And it was just a matter of finishing it off. And um, although that took an extra half an hour, it was extremely challenging. Uh, it was very, it was a very wonderful moment to, to be at the top of um, the highest point of the world. Of course, I've been fortunate enough to be on very many other mountains and in their own rights, whether I've been there with friends or um, if they've been technically challenging, but they mean just as much to me as this does. Um, but there is something special about knowing you can't get any higher. Um, the expedition is about two and a half months, uh, so uh, be expected to, to be out there and live in uh, um, life uh, very basic really uh, for, for, 
couple of months. Uh, and, you know, that suits me well when you know the equipment you've got, you know the kind of um, skills that you need and you go in with those skills. And this is something that you uh, then focus on. The view looking down, you can see that was that camp that we just looked at, uh, moving down along this ridge line. Again, you may look at it and think not challenging, or you may look at it and think, wow, that's really steeper than I thought. You know, it is very challenging. There are lines that run along this walkway, um, but they're connected with uh, pitons, maybe a few nuts, um, but you never know if they could pop out. Honestly, w with the uh, freeze thaw cycle of the rocks warming up uh, and the pitons, they can come out very easily. So even if you were to fall, you probably wouldn't slide all the way down the faces, but you would still slide quite away. And of course, it's very easy with crampons on to um, break a, an ankle or even just twist an ankle. And you know at this point, it's very difficult to, uh, to come down on your own or even with any kind of support at that point with uh, um, just even a twisted ankle. This, um, this is our, our campsite and our tents are right around this area. Um, people ask me before I get any questions about um, um, were there any deceased people on the mountain and uh, yes there were there's no doubt about it fortunate enough for me that particular year was a heavy snow year and therefore um, they got covered a lot um, back in the day, Sherpas would tend not to want to touch um, dead people so they were left where they were as they've slightly got a little bit more westernized, they will push them down over the face or they will cover them. And some of these tents back here are old and all wrapped up and um, there's definitely a couple of dead people in those uh, tents still, um, just all wrapped up. Um, it was quite peculiar um, how you see things. I remember walking past um, one guy and I remember thinking even now, that is a funny place to sleep. Why is he sleeping there? That's so weird. And then just, it took me about a minute and, and then I thought to myself, that guy wasn't sleeping. He was actually, you know, dead from, from a couple of days ago. And um, the fact that I couldn't even twig onto it straight away was... Uh, just goes to show how the altitude can really affect you. Uh, just a quick story. Um, one of the guys was in, that was in our team um, summited after we did. Um, we were quite worn out, so we ended up sleeping back in one of these tents after summiting. Uh, he got back to, a to uh, one of the tents later on. The next day, uh, we woke up. We were going to go down the mountain, and he could uh, hardly see at all. Um, 10 minutes later, he couldn't see at all. So at this point, we had to get him down the mountain, not being able to see at all. Um, you know, I know we play these games in, in team building exercises or when we're kids of bringing people across logs and over bridges, things like that, being blind. But this was a real life, life case scenario where we had to bring him down all the way, telling him where to move his feet, where to, you know, uh, where rocks were left and right and that was a, a real experience obviously for him and, and us um, but just goes to show these things can happen and you have to deal with them there was actually uh, the Russell Bryce um, TV show Beyond the Limit uh, was filming that particular year and um, one of the, the guys that came up Tim he was a, a biker guy um, it was so interesting, the fact that we kind of had this mini rescue going on um, and he was coming up with a TV camera um, and it's just so surreal sometimes, the different worlds that we live in. Um, but he was fine. It was some blindness. It's because he didn't have his sunglasses on going down and the glare from the sun off the bright sunlight. And obviously that connected to the, the altitude um, gave him some... Um, temporary snow blindness for several days. Moving on from there, Kosciuszko, from the highest to the lowest, uh, highest point in Australia. And um, it's well worth doing if you're in Australia. It's always a, a fantastic place to be over there in the snowy mountains. It's a, uh, just above 7,000 feet. And it's quite ironic, really, because it's the only mountain I didn't actually get to see. So you think of Australia being hot all the time, 
wasn't necessarily the case. This picture on the right hand side, I didn't take it, so that's what it looks like. It was, um, it was more like this picture on the left hand side. Again, I didn't take this picture on the left here, um, but as you can see, Australia uh, does get snow, and especially in the snowy mountains, and this was my visit um, and my viewpoint of uh, Kosciuszko on the right hand side and that just comes back to saying you know you could think of Australia shorts sunscreen make sure I've got my hat but you also have to think all right I have to be completely com prepared I have to make sure I've got my jacket I have to make sure I've got extra layers uh, hat gloves and the correct footwear moving from one of the um, Australia's highest point to Karstens Pyramid. Uh, luckily, by this point, I was um, leading groups a lot more. So fortunately enough, I was able to lead a group um, to um, Indonesia. And this is uh, Western Papua, which is in uh, New Guinea, which is in the islands of Indonesia. And uh, it was really a quite the experience for me because uh, as you can see right here, it's, uh, we met up with the Danai tribe and they are fairly rustic um, a form of tribe and uh, it's actually the last known point of uh, cannibalism so you can't help but think of that being on the back of your mind. Uh, but that's one of the things I really liked about this mountain was the five days of jungle trekking to get through it. Um, you can see some of the river crossings that we had to take. Um, and uh, the experiences that we had even just to, to get to the mountain. Um, when you do get to the mountain, as you can see, the face is right in front of me here. Um, I would love to have done one of these more technical routes. Uh, they are very challenging as far as climbing grades go, but there is a 5.9 up there which would be ideal. That wasn't what we went in to do. Um, our route was more over towards this right-hand side, uh, which is still a lot of fourth and fifth class. But as you can see, we did use hand ascenders here to, to have as a guide and also to help with uh, connection points for our um, to stay onto the mountain if any of us were to fall. We did have a rope and we did do some uh, technical climbing and, and belaying in certain areas, but most of it was like this. You can actually see a little notch right there. Uh, that notch there was this uh, area here that we're looking at, as you can see there's a traverse, which was extremely airy. And because of this uh, mountain is quite popular now, um, they have put bolts in there, which is quite beneficial to everybody because it helps the flow move a lot quicker. But fantastic mountain up there with, uh, with no big jacket on, so that makes it more, uh, more of a pleasant experience as far as the weather is concerned. And we really did en enjoy the, uh, the summit. With the expedition length of around three weeks, and that actual um, from the bottom of the mountain, a 2,000 foot gain, you can go in there um, and, and take a helicopter to the bottom to the lake uh, and climb it from there, which really reduces it down to about a week or so. But I wanted to go in with this experience of a walk in across the jungle. Now, the exact opposite to the jungle is Vincent, which is in uh, Western Antarctica. Um, in the Centennial Range. I've been wanting to experience Antarctica for a very long time. I was fortunate enough to go about 10 years or so ago, but ever since then I've wanted to work there and experience it uh, and really be a part of Antarctica. Um, this last year I was fortunate enough to, to get a position there and um, be a mountain leader um, among and many other things that I did there. You sh as you can see, looking down from a plane, uh, it's very remote. It's very um, open. And, and this guide here on the right hand side, the red line is the, the uh, route that we take to the top of the mountain. As you can see, it's the same point that you come through around the backside and get to the top. Uh, if you were to do the mountain just straight from, from base camp, it actually only takes three or four days. But as you can see by this picture, you get flown in just with one um, otter there, set yourself up a camp, and um, you, you spend a couple of days there. You pull your pulks in towards the, uh, the first camp, 
And as you can see, this is actually the first camp there. So you really are in the middle of nowhere. From there, you come on down towards this steeper section, and then you pull yourself um, through and you hike through um, this, this large section, 800 uh, feet or so of fixed lines. Um, so you are able to climb up onto uh, higher sections of the mountain. There are definitely other routes that you can do, um, the Messner route and, and, um, and so forth, but they're a little bit more challenging. This is more of a regular route and hard enough as it is uh, because you do have that um, cold weather and just cold style living, you know, finding that you have to wake yourself up um, to cold temperatures and how you're going to deal with cooking. Um, because there is 24 hours sunlight, you don't necessarily have to be getting up at that three, four o'clock in the morning as you would with many other mountains. It's more of if the sun is on your tent, you've got that um, solar radiation, it's warming it up a little bit. Get up then compared to if the sun wasn't on your tent, it really is extremely cold. As you can see here, uh, I always take my Alpine Rescue Team flag with me. Um, I you know, get the glory and being able to do these presentations. But um, I often feel bad in a way that they are the ones that are back home, which is a team I am a, I'm a part of. And they're the ones doing all the rescues and helping folks out that need, uh, need it. And um, without very much thanks at all. So just a, a big thank you to those guys for doing what they do. And um, we really appreciate that. Of course, I always take my fun photos as well. I can't go anywhere without taking my axe guitar and uh, pretty much got one of those with every mountain I'm on where I'm on snow. But um, as long as you keep moving, um, it's not as cold as you think with that sun out. It is extremely cold, but uh, um, it's, uh, it's really a pleasant um, environment to be in. Expedition does take about two weeks. You could do the whole thing in about a week, but because the weather is so unpredictable, um, you could lose a couple of days with um, weather, uh, with planes, with backups. Uh, it does take about two weeks and about just over 800 feet of elevation gain. So the question is now, what do I do next? You would have asked me a couple of months ago, and I would have said, I'm going to hang out with my little baby boy. He's now about five months old, Elliot. The idea was to, to ju just enjoy him, do a little bit more technical rock climbing down the road and, um, and bring him into the world and, and show him what climbing and mountaineering and fun things we can do together. Uh, but the actual reality is, is that I was uh, fortunately enough asked to go back uh, to Antarctica and I'm in just a couple of weeks time, I'm going to be going back to do a transantarctic trip, uh, the Messner route, which is from the edge of the um, Antarctic ice cap um, to the pole. So that's going to be about uh, two months of travel, um, pulling a polk and uh, my food with an, an expedition there. And um, um, initially, I, you know, I wasn't thinking I was going to go back so soon, um, but it was, how could you possibly turn this down, as I'm sure you're thinking the same thing. Um, so uh, excited to do that and uh, looking forward to, to packing up to doing that soon. From there, I just want to say, you know, whatever you decide to do in life, whether it's extreme mountaineering or extreme knitting, if you have a goal, you can do it. Um, even with my little twig arms here, my noodle arms, you know, I can't really do too much with power lifting or anything like that. But as long as you've got a, a strong mind, um, some might even say a little selfish, you can do it. Um, there's many, many times where I thought to myself, you know, I I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm not comfortable. I'm not happy. Um, but if you get that experience, you get that training, um, and you believe in yourself and others believe in you, uh, you can do it. Um, this is my plug here just to say thank you to my wife, Tori, uh, all my friends and family to say, you know, go and do it. You know, you've got it. You can do it once you get out there. And it really does mean a lot to me. Um, Sometimes I think, oh, you know, I'm not sure about this, um, but they know I can do it. Ultimately, I know I can do it. So uh, it sometimes can be a little bit scary, 
a little bit challenging, um, but go for it and, and you can complete what you uh, want to do. With that said, there's always, I have all these motivational pictures and, and things around me um, really help me believe that we can do it. So if you want to go and climb our cap, it might take you five years, but you can go and do it. If you want to go and hike a 14 -er, you know, you may need lots of training and lots of experience in the lower peaks to, to get yourself ready so you understand what kind of clothing you need, what kind of fitness you need to be in. You can do that too. Or whatever you want to do, um, you can you can do that. So uh, I'm going to finish off just here by saying thank you very much and um, just quoting Sir Edmund Hillary here. It's not the mountain we conquer but ourselves. So I've never conquered a mountain uh, in my life. I just like to climb them and, and they're fortunate enough to, to let me climb a piece of ice or whatever it may be. I just enjoy doing it. And remember, you don't have to be a fantastic hero to do certain things to compete. You can just be an ordinary chap motivated to reach challenging goals. And um, that's the way I see it, no matter whatever it may be, whether it's a, a position that you're looking at at work or, or a challenging mountain or a, a ski slope or, or whatever it may be. Um, just enjoy whatever you're doing, um, whether that's you've got a, a young baby at home and you enjoy being with them or uh, something crazy, just as long as uh, you enjoy what you're doing. So on that note, I'm going to finish it off and say thank you very much for sticking with me here. And um, Jeff, it's uh, back to you. All right, Martin, thank you so much. That was uh, incredible, very informative, and uh, makes me want to go climb some mountains today, right away. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, we do have uh, time for some questions if you want to stick around. So. Um, um, I will uh, read the questions and then uh, you can provide some answers for us, hopefully, there. Um, first question is, are there any other big mountains that you plan to climb? Um, you know, the, that's an interesting question. Right now, I would say no, there isn't um, because I've been fortunate enough to, to do so many and because I've got Elliot. But honestly, realistic, that's not the answer. Um, I will continue to keep climbing mountains. So maybe I might like to do Chimborazo uh, over in Ecuador. I'd love to go up and, and, and um, go back to uh, maybe go to Hawaii and climb some of those out. Um, volcanoes but I don't really have any plans to go back to Antarctica sorry back to the Himalayas right now I would like to go back and, and finish off uh, the Matterhorn and um, there's been several mountains I've been fortunate enough to climb but that was one I had to turn back around on so probably the mountain I'd probably like to most finish off is um the Matterhorn and um, maybe switching gears a little bit. I, w I would love to climb Al Cap, um, but then I need to, to focus my goals a little bit more towards a little bit more aid climbing. So that's where I'm at right now. But you ask me again in a, a few more months and I'm sure <laughs> that might change. <laughs> I knew you had a few uh, on your mental list there. I'm sure you've even looked at a few maps of those mountains uh, <laughs> as well. Um, okay, next question. On Everest, did you use a higher rate of oxygen when climbing than when you slept? Yes, absolutely. So when we were climbing, we probably used about more towards one and a half to three liters, depending on what we were doing. If we were doing a slow plod where we would try and bring it down be, to try and conserve our uh, oxygen, whereas if we were going up towards the second step, so there's three steps before you get to the final pyramid, we would turn that up. But of course, it's really helpful and you think it's great and you can you can fly up there. I say fly up, but really it's a very, very slow maneuver. Um, but you've got to remember in the back of your mind that you um, – are running out of oxygen and you only have about two or three bottles depending on what you decide to do. So often you'll go up uh, to a certain area, you'll leave a bottle there 
go up and come back down and continue on with that bottle to bring you back down. But if you run out of oxygen when you're coming back down before you reach that bottle, you've got to be extremely aware that you're not going to have any supplemental oxygen before you get to that bottle. Whereas some people may go up and carry two bottles with them, but of course that means you have to carry two bottles. Um, so some people may have Sherpa support, some people carry it themselves. So it's just different kind of strategy types. Okay, great. Let's go to the next question here. Um, what has been your biggest logistics challenge in your climbing career? Um, often it's very much um, dealing with permits. Permits is a tricky one because you're trying to organize it from here and therefore you don't really know exactly what permits you always need. You can read it up that you need permits to, for this certain mountain but then you realize if you're going from um, going into Tibet therefore you need different kinds of permits for um, for um, moving into different countries. But right now, honestly, but being that I was with a, uh, a guiding company for most part, they would organize that. Um, I would then say most of the issues were making sure that we've got enough food and we've got, we're taking food from here or are we going to buy it there? And if we're going to buy it in places like Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan, can we even get that kind of food there? And, and is it the kind of food that we would like to eat? Definitely going through some logistics uh, fun and games right now, deciding that we've got a couple of caches and, and how much we're going to pull on our pork, how much we're going to need for weight, how much extra food we're going to need, how much extra fuel we're going to need. So it's all a balance of... Sure, we could take the minimum amount of fuel, but then if we are going to spend an extra day there or an extra two days there, are we going to have enough food and fuel for us to eat? But at the same time, you don't want to take all that extra food and fuel knowing that it's quite heavy. And I'm a big fan of not leaving anything behind, so as much leave no trace as possible. Everything comes down with me and my expedition. Okay. Um, next question. How often were you able to communicate with your family in these remote areas? Yeah, sometimes that's really difficult because it's not very often. Um, you actually can go to Everest Base Camp now and you can get Wi-Fi and you can use sat phones. Um, sometimes it's fantastic to call home and to hear their voices and to be able to speak to them and they know that I'm okay. Uh, and I love it. And then I turn that, you know, phone off and then it makes me sad because it makes me realize I'm not going to be able to talk to them again. So usually um, about once a week, if possible. Uh, and I, I would just uh, phone home and, and find out just what's going on and, and um, just to hear their voice. And, and I think that's beneficial that they can hear that I'm going on okay and, and you know they can hear my voice um, because usually I say no news to them is good news if you don't hear from me for two weeks three weeks it's probably more likely um, communications is difficult rather than something's happened because if something happens this day and age the media knows about it or the rest of the expedition knows about it certainly and they've also got my contact information to call either my friends or family or the, the uh, agency that I'm working with. But it can be very difficult sometimes. Okay, and uh, the last question, speaking of family, how young will Elliot be when he summits Everest? Oh boy, it's, that, it's funny you should say that because um, my parents have always encouraged me to do everything I possibly can and I know they've been extremely nervous and wary and you know I've always said I'll be okay I'll be you know safe I'm gonna do the best I can but even now knowing that I've got a son my mind frame has changed it's very different to <laughs> being very cautious about you know oh now I can really appreciate what my family have been going through uh, compared to beforehand going off to doing the things that I want to do. 
So I wish Everest the best, uh, Elliot the best. If he wants to do Everest, I'll give him as much in, you know support as I can. But if he wants to be in a soccer team, I'll give him as much support as I can as well. Um, but uh, for the next few years, at least, we will be going out hiking. He's already been climbing with us and climb and and climbing to uh, hiking all over the place. So uh, fortunately enough, uh, my wife and I like to do those kinds of things, and I'm going to support him to do whatever he wants to do uh, in a safe and uh, controlled manner. So who knows is the answer to that? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, it's, it's up to him. Well, I guess we'll yep. wait and find out. Well, that ends our uh, question and answer uh, session there. And I, is there any last thing you want to say? Um, I don't believe there is. Just uh, good luck. With whatever, with whatever you want to do, if you do want to contact me either, uh, for PMI or, or uh, ask any more questions or any thoughts, please feel free to contact me on uh, mbarnett, that's M-B-A-R-N-E-T-T, -T, at pmirope.com, and uh, I promise I'll get back to you, and um, if you're in the Denver area, I'm more than welcome to, to meet up with you, and uh, take care out there, don't rush into anything, just get lots of experience, and uh, enjoy it, and thank you for coming Great. in today. And uh, Well, thank you very much, Martin. We really appreciate you joining uh, PMI's technical webinar series, and we appreciate everybody for uh, registering and for your questions and uh, interest. And um, we um, do have an ongoing uh, technical webinar series, so stay tuned to uh, Facebook and, and our social media outlets to find out more about when those webinars will be. Um, but uh, we're going to sign off for now, and thank you very much. Have a great day. Stay safe out there.